frogs. So without any further ado, Michael, thank you very much Great. for coming and telling us all about frogs. Great. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, guys. So, yeah, I really appreciate you guys coming out today and uh, seeing me talk. Um, for, for kind of my personal uh, background experience, I worked as a biologist for the last six years, working with mostly um, the things that people don't like. Uh, I've done a lot of research on bats in Mexico and Belize. Uh, I've worked with a, a species of snake called the uh, giant garter snake. And, uh, excuse me, in uh, central California near Sacramento. If you guys don't know, it is the largest species of garter snake that we have here, and it's uh, completely endemic, only lives in Central Valley, California. But also uh, tiger salamanders, uh, California tiger salamanders, red-legged frogs, San Francisco garter snakes as well, something you guys may know a little bit about. But I'm gonna talk to you guys about frogs and why frogs are kind of what's going on with frogs around the world today. But first, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna go back to the classroom and we're gonna learn a little bit about frogs. Specifically, frogs are old, really, really old, and some of the oldest fossils, you know, 362 million years ago that some of these um, first amphibians were coming up out of the land, you know, coming into the, onto land. So, but also, amphibians go through this amazing process of metamorphosis. They're linked to water, they need some sort of moisture, and also this uh, metamorphosis is unique among vertebrates, animals with a backbone. So we all know about, you know, butterflies become, you know, they start off as a caterpillar, then become a butterfly. Well, amphibians, just like this California tiger salamander here, you know, a big female will come down the pond and lay about 800 eggs. And just one or two at a time lay, you know, a bunch of eggs at the bottom, and they all become these beautiful larvae. So frogs, tadpoles, salamanders, larvae. That's you know, but then they, you know, environmental conditions change. The water actually starts to dry in these ponds, and then they, their gill buds recede, so these have these long gills, and they recede, and their tail fins will shrink up, and they come out on the land. And it's an amazing process of tiger salamanders, and it happens with many different species of amphibians as well. So, but all the different types of amphibians, we have about 7,000, and that's a good amount. Um, but most of those are gonna be the frogs and the toads, so like this red-eyed tree frog. And also, you know, here in California, we have about 30 species, and I say about because we're actually finding that some species that we thought were, you know, one are actually four different types. For example, uh, right now we're going over the Pacific chorus frog, you know, Pacific tree frog. It actually might be divided up into four different subspecies. So we're finding new things about amphibians as we learn more about them. And so in this one here called the coastal tail frog, doesn't call. It lives in uh, Mendocino area, uh, northern Humboldt, lives in redwood forests, lives in these very fast flowing streams. And it actually has evolved to not call. Not to mention tail frog, it's one of the only species of two different types of species that have internal fertilization. Um, it actually has a tail which is used as, well, for internal fertilization. Amazing, amazing process, amazing frogs. My favorite group are the salamanders, and there's only about 600 of those in the world. So, you know, not very many. And um, mostly though, you know, it's interesting because California has an amazing climate and it's really good for salamanders. This Mediterranean climate is really appropriate for salamanders. So we have about 50 species of these. And they range, um, we have some, you know, I, I imagine, you know, you guys are at a zoo talk, you might be outdoors types, you know, getting into nature. If you've seen some of the amphibians in the Bay Area, the salamanders, you know, we have the Pacific giant or the coastal giant salamander, you know, gets about 12 inches long, huge, beautiful, different varieties of encetinas and the little slender salamanders like these guys, a diversity of salamander species in California. We live in an amazing climate for salamanders. And then lastly, the last group of um, amphibians are the Sicilians. And if you've ever seen one of these, um, either you've been to a zoo or a pet store, or you've been in the tropics, they only live along the equator and they are completely limbless. They're basically the snake version, you know, the snake in the amphibian world. And they live underground in burrows and hot uh, human uh, uh, climates. And you can really only find them like this when after big, heavy tropical rains, they kind of get flooded in their burrows and drown and float to the surface. But this individual here was three feet long. And that's an amazing, weird amphibian, very cool. And then, so where do amphibians live? Well, actually, amphibians live all over the world. It, for example, in the French Alps, National Geographic uh, put out this amazing uh, article about snow frogs, frogs in the French Alps. They actually come out and breed when there's snow on the ground. They come into partially frozen ponds and breed. But most amphibians live in the tropics. Um, and for example, here, this is uh, basically looking at a, a rainforest scene in Guatemala. Um, when I was there in January, I was looking at uh, different species of amphibians down there. 
And I'm, you know, I'm from Sacramento now. I live in Oakland. I'm used to living here looking for amphibians. And so when I think of where I'm going to find a salamander, I'm, you know, oh, I'm going to flip logs, flip rocks. That's how I'm going to find them. But here, you know, the tropics, it's just a three-dimensional environment. They can, amphibians can be anywhere. Like, for example, like this salamander here is about six feet off the ground. And the Guatemala, uh, Guatemalan biologists were all laughing at me as I walked right past it. How did you not see the salamander right in front of your eyes? I'm not, I'm not thinking about that. But that's what's fascinating here, because this salamander, it's only about two inches long, and it lives you know, 30, 40 feet up in the canopy. That's incredible. So, and it's tiny little salamander, they climb very high from the ground. It, they're all over in the tropical rainforest. But back home, you know, this is Livermore. And so, big cattle pond, you know, we see a lot of these along the Central Valley, driving around 599. And, but, you know, this is a cow pond. It's, it's pretty uh, a gross environment. About 100 cows visit this particular pond a day. And, you know, what you could think, cows, a lot of cow poop, not a very pretty place. But it has thousands of California tiger salamanders in it. Because the tiger salamander used to be all over the Central Valley, but because of agriculture and um, kind of homes coming up, we've restricted their populations to now where they have to live in cow ponds and vernal pools as well. But thousands of sal salamanders live in here. Big, beautiful ones, giant gills. Because these cow ponds have very low oxygen, so they need big gills to absorb all that oxygen. Okay, so got a little bit of brief introduction about, you know, what amphibians are, where they live, but what's happening to them? You know, what, save the frog, some of you guys might be wondering what this is all about. You know, Joe mentioned a little bit about, you know, how amphibians are doing very well right now, but that's actually very true. And so of those 7,000 species that I talked a little bit about, 2,000 of those are threatened with extinction. Now, you know, threatened means that, right, they are a threat. So they may not be endangered yet or on that, that red list, but they're coming along the way. They're going to be, uh, they're at risk right now. And in the last 30, 40 years, we've seen actually about 200 species gone extinct. And some of these amphibians that I like to talk about, these two um, species here come from Australia, but this one here is just a favorite of mine. You know, the northern gastric brooding frog. <laughs> kind of a weird name. And uh, might, you might kind of wonder what that's about. Well, you know, northern gastric brooding frog, so, what this frog does is that when it lays uh, its eggs, it'll have a few eggs, and it turns around and, well, there's not much known about it scientifically, but under cap, uh, captive conditions, it would actually, you know, swallow its eggs, and then they would develop inside of its stomach. Now, that's kind of amazing. Why would you do that? Um, well, the womb, or excuse me, the stomach actually becomes a womb. It can turn off the, uh, the metabolic processes, no digestive acids, anything like that. And then eventually the frogs, you know, they develop inside the stomach, and then she kind of coughs them up. That's incredible, and that's an amazing way to protect your young, because you don't have to guard your eggs, you don't have to hide your eggs, you just take your eggs with you. It's an amazing process. And there are only two species that did this, and both of them are extinct now. And that's very unfortunate, um, something I think we'd like to have seen in the future more about. But all these, what's going on with amphibians? Uh, the main threat is habitat destruction. And it's this, you know, a lot of species are affected by habitat destruction, from pandas to tigers, et cetera. All these um, animals are affected by it, but amphibians are hurt very hard. This example here is in Guatemala. And you can kind of see just rainforest, 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 and then, you know, patch missing. And so what actually is going on here, these are fern farms. Now, so if you ever go, you know, buy a bouquet for your, you know, relative or someone you care about and you find little ferns in them, there's a chance that these ferns actually might have come from Guatemala at this particular site. But this particular site actually, actually happens to be the last stronghold of many critically endangered species in Guatemala. And um, actually it's a, it's a cloud forest and cloud forests are slightly cooler, they're higher elevation and it's where amphibians love to be. They like it to be kind of cool, very moist. And this area, we're just seeing, it's just getting taken piece by piece by piece. And so, and this is a trend not only in Guatemala, but all over Central America, all over the Americas, all over the world, this is happening. So this is why it's the major number one threat to uh, amphibian species. Now, infectious disease is probably number two. Now, and I talked about that gastric brooding frog. Well, it was wiped out by this disease. And I'm just curious, um, how many of you guys have heard of the chytrid fungus? Okay, so you guys are, definitely one of my more informed crowds. Uh, you've heard about it. And so you might even know this frog here. It's called the Panamanian golden frog. Uh, actually, Oakland Zoo has some on display right now. And they've done a lot of amazing captive breeding efforts. But these amphibians here, you cannot find these in the wild anymore. 
they live, and it's funny because they're, they're, they have very pristine rainforest, cloud forests. It's, for the most part, it's doing really well, except the entire area is in, uh, basically infected with this fungus that has spread all over Central America. And now these numbers were just wiped out. So you cannot find these individuals in the wild. But thankfully, scientists went out, got as many as they could, and brought them back into captivity and are now breeding them, hopefully for one day of releasing them. So the chytrid fungus, yeah, I talked about how it started. It, I mean, it's all over Central America. Well, it's actually all over the world now. And we still don't even know exactly where it came from. Um, some scientists, there's a, now there's an out of Japan theory, as where it used to be, we used to thought it came from Africa. But long story short is that we're still a lot of uncertainties about it. But what we do know is that it's all over the world. And it's, yeah, in 36 different countries it's been um, found. But also, there's not very much research that's been put into this, so it could be many more. Um, it's just the, the amphibian species, um, not so many biologists out there work with amphibians, and there's so many, I guess, so much help that can be done right now to find out where the fungus is. But now it's, it's not really about where it is anymore. It's about what can we do to help the amphibians that are already there that are getting hurt by this. And also, you know, this poor little golden frog, he, um, I, I show this slide to kids sometimes, and. Uh, they all start laughing, and it's, he looks really silly, right? He's got this big bulbous nose, big swollen arms, but judging by your, some of your faces, this is not a happy frog. This is actually a very un, uh, unhappy frog. And it's unfortunate because when you have a, a species that you, know, you only have in captivity now, and you find something wrong with it and you have no idea why, that's, that's horrible, because uh, you're going to lose that animal if you don't know what's wrong with it. And you know, time is of the essence when it comes to captive breeding amphibians. And so poor, this poor individual, we have no idea what's wrong with it. You know, other great threats, you know, pollution and pesticides. It's one that we, we hear a lot about protecting our streams, you know, what goes into our water. Um, but we're starting to find, actually here in California, weird things are popping up <laughs> all over, uh, you know, where a lot of agricultural runoff is. You know, for example, this frog here um, has far too many legs than he should have, way too many legs. And this is a result um, that we're finding just some of these amphibians in these ecosystems that have a lot of um, you know, pesticide runoff, uh, fertilizer runoff, other chemicals, we're starting to see them actually have you know, missing limbs, many limbs, multiple eyes. And that's a good indication of, well, there's something going on in the environment. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But the other big one, too, is global warming climate change. And this is a threat that we're going to see more of. And this example here is that amphibian um, uh, from Guatemala, where it's being clear cut. Well, this little salamander right here doesn't even have a common name, but there's only about a thousand of them left. And it's only endemic to that little forest that I showed you a photo of. And unfortunately, if temperatures get warmer, you know, we've seen a one, um, one degree rise, actually. So far, if it keeps getting warmer, well, you know, amphibians that like to stay cool, they're going to keep going up the mountain. And eventually, they're going to run out of mountains. And to put this into context, if some of you guys, you know, more into mammals, for a chance, you might know about this little guy called the pika. And in the Sierra Nevada, this is where the, this species of pika lives. And this is happening. This exact same phenomenon is happening here. As temperatures are getting warmer, the pikas, which is a relative of the rabbit, and I think way cuter than any rabbit, but they live, they live high up on the talus slopes um, in the Sierra Nevada. And they're moving further and further up. And eventually, they're going to run out of mountaintop as well. So climate change isn't just going to affect um, amphibians, but it's going to affect other mammals, uh, other animals as well. And eventually, it will affect us as well, too. And then so over-harvesting. Um, whether it's for the pet trade, for food, um, we need to look at what we're taking out of the wild. This is a big problem with, um, with amphibians, and reptiles especially, too. Um, because it's unregulated. There really isn't much you know, research about the impacts, the effects. But um, uh, you know, back to Guatemala, I received a report there about some species that were smuggled out of Guatemala, and they were brought in the United States, and then they were, they were seized you know, by officials in Florida. And they actually found that they had about two or three endangered species of frogs that were in this, you know, endangered in the wild already, and then they're bringing them back to bring for the pet trade. Now, yeah, and just that, that stress of bringing animals out of the wild, you know, it's about 80% of amphibians actually will survive to make it to someone's home as a pet. So we need to look at this trade as well, because this is a big threat. But the food trade, the <laughs> frog legs. San Francisco loves frog legs. You know, I don't know, I'm curious. Um, I'm curious just how many people have had frog legs. OK. OK. Well, some people have. And 
<coughs> but frog legs are very common in San Francisco. We have a, a lot of people that like to eat them. But the problem with this trade is that one, it's the number one frog that's chosen is the bullfrog. And if some of you guys don't know about how kind of uh, bad the bullfrog is for invasive species wise, this uh, it's also a uh, just a, the big meaty frog. You know, it makes sense that you would want to eat it for frog legs. But they come from the southeastern United States, but when you actually get frog legs, they're actually um, from China, they, or China or southeastern um, Asia, because they have these farms, these giant frog farms, where they keep all these bullfrogs from the United States, and they raise them up, and they ship them all over the world. This is actually why the bullfrog is one of the biggest uh, problems in many other countries besides the United States, because we ship this frog all over. And also, it's just a, a vector for disease. These ponds are, these frogs are, you know, close contamination, their harbingers are chytrid fungus, other diseases, and then we ship them all over the world. They sometimes get out. This is why this trade. Again, unregulated, completely unregulated. So back to that invasive species part. I like to talk about this because I've done a lot of work with bullfrogs. Um, they're big. They're big frogs, really big. Um, and not only um, are they a threat to amphibians, but if you think about other species as well, I worked with the giant garter snake. The giant garter snake gets about 54 inches. That's a big snake. Um, and the largest giant garter snake that was found inside of a bullfrog was 33 inches. And the giant garter snake is already a threatened species. And when you have a non-natural predator coming in, it's affecting them as well. But again, these guys are really big. And so we're going to start seeing that as more of these frogs take over, we're going to start seeing more impacts on our native amphibians, especially the California red-legged frog, which you guys can find, actually, in the hills surrounding here. Um, but one thing we're going to have to look into. Another issue that people don't think about with the, uh, the bullfrog is you know, not necessarily hybridization, but uh, you know, Dr. Krieger and I, we actually went out in Santa Cruz and found this you know, amorous pair. Now, OK. I like to talk about this because this, this is funny. So this is a big bullfrog, and this is the male California red-legged frog. And they're both about adults. They're good-sized adults. Now, if nothing would come of this. You're not going to have some freak of nature California red-legged bullfrog hybrid. But actually, there is some science behind this. And this does hurt amphibians in the sense that it hurts the California red-legged frog. And it's something called, it's a, uh, it's a reproductive trap. And so bullfrogs, they like to stay around ponds. They like to be around the water a lot. Now, red-legged frogs, to an extent, they go away. They go up in the surrounding hillsides. They go in the vegetation, the riparian zones. And they'll, they'll go back. But so during the winter time, actually right about this time, when it starts raining a lot, the male frogs go down the ponds first. And then they'll start calling, and that brings in the female frogs. Now, when these male frogs get to these ponds, and they find these big, gorgeous girls there, they immediately implex, and they don't call. They already, well, they found who they're going to mate with. Now, and that actually, so those, that actually means what happens is because the males didn't call, the females didn't come to the pond. And so those females either just didn't breed that year or they'll go to another pond. And so you can actually have ponds that become dead zones where you only have males coming but no females with bullfrogs. So interesting phenomenon with these guys. And also, I've worked a lot with uh, California tiger salamanders, and they're, they're pretty precious to me because they're an endemic salamander. They only live in the Central Valley. Now, something interesting, though, oh, excuse me, going a little fast here. This one here is not normal for California tiger salamanders. California tiger salamanders do not do this. This is called pedomorphism. It's when a salamander stays in its larval state, so you know, it has its big gills, it lives in water, has to be in water, and it can actually become a reproductive adult. They call them pedomorphs. Um, there is a, a non-native species of salamander that was brought uh, to California about the 1950s. One entrepreneur in the Salinas Valley thought, well, I want some good bass bait. And you know, he was from Texas, and they had barred tiger salamanders down there. And they thought about these. These are just great bass bait. And he was like, well, the salamanders here don't do that. So he got a couple truckloads of these uh, non-native salamanders and just dumped them in Salinas. He didn't know any better. Well, unfortunately, what happened was is that these did really well. And so they started spreading out, and they started hybridizing. Now, this is actually both these individuals are hybrids. So they actually do hybridize with the, uh, the native salamander. And now um, US Fish and Wildlife Service and California Fish and Game are in a regulatory nightmare, because what do you protect? Do you protect the native 
uh, that has 10% hybrid genes or do you protect all of them? Do you protect only pure species? Because in the Salinas Valley, it's, it's very hard to find a pure population now. And um, kind of nearby here, near Walnut Creek in the Ohlone Wilderness, I performed these experiments with, um, well, um, this is through UC Davis, and I was looking at um, growth of the hybrids versus the natives. And what you can see, I'm, I mean, you kind of just see one giant salamander, right? And so this is actually a hybrid, and these are the natives on the side. Um, the natives just, they grow at their natural rate, and the hybrids, well, they do much better, much better than both the, uh, the non-native and the, uh, the native. And so and these salamanders were kept in these big uh, pens in ponds out in this wilderness area, and they were all offered the same amount of food, everything, the hybrids do better. So this is really unfortunate for me because at some point, we're gonna see that our native amphibians, well, at least this, in this salamander, will not, you know, it's gonna be a hybrid. It won't be a California tiger salamander. So, and to me, that's just, I don't know, as a Californian, I think that's very unfortunate. All right, so I've told you a lot, and you, a lot of people, they, they're like, oh my gosh, that's so much information, that's so much you know, amphibians. Well, that's the point, is that amphibians are just getting hit at all sides, um, all over the world for different reasons, and it's having synergistic effects, and this is why we're seeing 2,000 species are at threat of extinction. Now, it's kind of, sometimes it's hard to convince people, though, why this matters. You know, it's easy to, you know, why do you want to save a tiger? You know, charismatic megafauna, you know, big, beautiful animal. But why would you want to save a frog? Well, I would argue that each one has its separate rights. Um, but also, frogs are incredibly important for the food web. Um, like here, for example, this is a, a cat eye snake in Panama about to munch on a, um, a very adorable little frog called a tungra frog. And this is an important process. And frogs, they make up the bottom of the food web. They make up the bottom of the food, um, um, food chain, I guess. And everything is connected in this web. And if you take it out, you know, it's kind of like Jenga. <laughs> if you guys, so you guys know about this game. So you have a tower of, uh, you know, blocks. And each block could represent a species or a group of organisms. And it is, you know, we are just taking blocks out left and right. And frogs would be a giant block at the middle. And if you take that out, it will collapse ecosystems. And this has already happened. In Panama, where we ta I talked about how um, those frogs are no longer in the wild, we've actually seen that the snakes that were only sold, you know, frog specialists, they've gone extinct. You can't find them there as well. The insect loads, gone way up the roof. So many more insects. And also, even to the point of the streams, have more algae blooms and more algae because the tadpoles would naturally eat the algae. So by taking the frogs out, we've already seen an impact in this one forest. But this is also happening other places where the frogs are gone. And so, yeah, and frogs eat the bad things. They eat the ticks, they eat the mosquitoes, you know. They eat those things that, you know, cause us frustration and headaches. So. And then, so I talked about the pollution and pesticide, how we're starting to see these amphibians that are, look weird. Well, amphibians are bioindicators. Their skin is so sensitive that they, environmental um, conditions will actually have an effect on them. You know, a little tadpole sits in water all day, you know, just more and more chemicals go through in and out that body. You start seeing things like this. And so if I was in my backyard and there was a frog out there with eight legs, I would be alarmed. I would be concerned. And it's just an indication of what's going on in our environment. So it's incredibly important to have. And we use frogs a lot in medicinal research. Um, for example, this one here, this phantasmal poison frog. Uh, scientists, uh, they made this um, from its poison. They synthesized a, um, a painkiller that's 200 times more powerful than morphine, and it's not addictive. That's incredible. And they're finding new um, research. Uh, new uh, research is done all the time. We're finding more and more benefits of frogs and their amazing skin. So something that, as we're losing these amphibian species, well, we're going to... We're going to miss out on these wonderful opportunities. It's like also, you know, just the same as losing the rainforest, lose, losing these plants, right along the same lines. And they make great parents. So <laughs> I like to kind of tug at the heartstrings a little bit that, you know, because a lot of people think reptiles and amphibians, um, you know, they don't, cold blooded, you know, they don't have emotion, they don't have anything. But this is to me a dedicated dad, in my opinion. So this is a male glass frog, and I call him a glass frog because he's see through. And if you took this leaf and flipped it up and put it at the top of the ceiling, that's what it would look like. Um, we're, we're in Panama right now. It's nighttime, and this male frog 
is above a stream and he's guarding his eggs. So the female has taken off um, and the male will sit here until these eggs develop, until they'll get swollen and full and the tadpoles will drip back down into the stream and then the frogs will crawl back up into the canopy. And yeah, he'll guard them from snakes, from you know, wasps that come up, other frogs. You know. And also, frogs are really cool. And I like to talk about this frog um, because this is the frog that I got me into this. This right here, um, this species is called Leptodactylus insularum. It doesn't have a common name. It's pretty obscure. It's a brown frog. It's about actually half this size. And uh, the indigenous people made this for me when I was down there. And, but what this frog does is, you know, you can see her. She's poking her head up and what looks around all this mass of tadpoles. And this is 3,000 individual tadpoles. And I know because I had to count these tadpoles. <laughs> and so what these tadpoles are doing is they're schooling together. And she is fiercely protecting them. And she is quite upset. Because um, I have to put a pit tag in her and she is not having it. It took me four hours to catch this frog. But these tadpoles school together. Sometimes um, about two to 8,000 tadpoles. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, yeah, she'll guard them from me. She'll guard them from uh, caiman, which is a, it's a species, you know, crocodilian. Uh, other snakes, birds, and she leads them around the marsh because um, they lay in these, uh, these marshes that they flood up with the tropical rains and they only last about two to three weeks and that's how long these uh, tadpoles will take to metamorphose. You know, a Pacific chorus frog will take up to three months to metamorphose. These guys in two weeks, incredibly fast metamorphosis and uh, this is just some other actively defending and she growls too and bites, <laughs> which is very, I, you know, I've never been, you know, kind of hesitant, you know, a frog, you know, no one's scared of frogs, but I don't know, if it growls at you, that's different. So, and so, and it's up to you guys. You know, the reason that I'm here today um, is, well, I'm very fortunate that, you know, you're listening to me, but also that, you know, it's up to you. It's up to you guys to go and make the difference because it really starts with one. And so, if you're ever getting a pet, you know, you want to get a captive bred individual. That's one of the most important things. We don't want to have, take more wild caught, or get more amphibians out of the wild. Um, and especially around this area, you know, we have had very little rain, especially for this time of year. Um, so the amphibians, I bet, are just jonesing to move right now. Because naturally, when it starts pouring that rain, we'll have these mass migrations of toads, the Cal uh, California newts, the rough skin newts. They'll all start just pouring out. And, well, they get hit by cars a lot. So on wet, rainy nights, you know, just slowing down really does make a difference. And then moving these amphibians off the road, too. And don't eat frog legs. So that's just one simple thing you can do to help. And then water conservation is frog conservation because, you know, we're in the north, we actually do have a little bit more water. But back in LA, they're in a water shortage all the time. So we need to conserve this water so we actually have it you know, for the amphibians, because we're draining lakes, draining reservoirs just for our own consumption. So we do want to conserve as well. And then bottled water, you know, I brought, you know, you see me drinking out of this, and uh, reusable is uh, very crucial. Um, do you guys know about the Pacific Gyre, the, the trash dump twice the size of Texas? And yeah, well, it's actually not unique to the Pacific Ocean. Actually, where all currents meet in all the oceans, there's basically trash that is accumulated. And a lot of that is plastic. And because plastic doesn't biodegrade, you know, you bury a plastic bottle in a banana peel, you know, what's going to last 100 years? So the plastic, it only photodegrades, it just gets smaller and smaller and smaller little bits. So we need to stop using that because it's, it's just ending up in, back in the ecosystem, you know? So again, don't purchase bottled water. And then just, yeah, that reducing, reusing, like frogs, go green, you know? Try and having this green lifestyle because we need to protect our planet. We need to save our planet. And then, most of you all hope we're voters, um, voting for the environment. We want to keep our parks open. We want to have these natural places because, you know, we're losing these places. Um, uh, especially as people get, you know, brought into cities, they start to kind of lose, um, you know, lose that nature mindset, lose how important an environment is. And they kind of get blindsided about how, you know, some forest somewhere doesn't matter. But it matters to all the animals that live there. It matter, matters to the ecosystems and the whole balance of the, the planet. So we need to vote to keep these, um, these places pristine, keep them for well, our use as well. And then 
I don't know if some of you are looking for careers, but you know, get into amphibian biology, encourage people to become biologists. Um, it's an amazing career and it's, it's brought me to many different countries all over Central America studying amazing organisms. I knew from a little kid that I wanted to, to do this um, and it's just been my passion ever since. So I encourage other people that are into that, that you know, they can even contact me, I'll talk your ear off about biology. And then, so uh, at our table we have info cards. It talks about everything that I spoke about today, you know, threats to amphibians and then how you guys can help on here. And I urge you guys to take one of these cards and then read it and then pass it along so that, you know, hopefully it spreads that word out. You know, if anything, at your dinner table tonight, oh, I heard this, you know, weird guy talking about frogs today. You know, what do you think about that? And then I'll have one more thing too. Um, because I imagine you know, some of you are zoo staff, docents, volunteers. Um, education is one of the most important things on, in my opinion. Uh, education is a very important thing. And it's very important to educate the next generation. Because we want them to know that uh, what, I, well, what should be considered important, like the environment. And for example, Save the Frogs, we were very fortunate to receive a grant to talk to 30 schools in San Francisco um, through Tree Frog Treks, if you guys have heard of that. And uh, San Francisco Head Start program is what this is called. And I've now spoken to 500 school kids um, just about amphibian ecology and amphibian conservation. And it's been an incredibly rewarding experience, especially when I have you know, one kid tell me he wants to be a biologist when he grows up. So I encourage all of you guys to really spend the time with kids and to get them excited about the environment.